اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاته والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين in speaking about life <coughs> and in trying to define what life is the definition of life and what we would like it to be uh, this is uh, for us important to understand if we want to live life correctly and if we want to take full advantage of the life that we have been given now when we want to know what life is let me go into it right away right and then inshallah we'll speak about uh, a little bit about the subject that was left over from yesterday uh when we speak about life right what do you want from life what do you want life to be right if you ask if i ask you the question what is the first thing that you want from life when you want to define life when you want to write your own life and say that this is the life that I want, right? What is the first thing that a human being would ask for in life, in defining life? The first thing, again, this is important, the first thing that a human being asks for, and you can look at it yourself and, you know, you can see it, what it is. The first thing that a human being naturally wants, a person wants from life, is that he wants life to be forever. He wants life to be forever. He doesn't want it to end. He doesn't want life to have an ending. That, okay, this is how much you have life and it's finished after this. End. No one wants to see an end to their life. And this is so uh, important for them that when they those who don't understand life and they think that death is the ending of life because death is is what they regard as the ending of life they are afraid to speak about death they are afraid to even come face to face with the idea of death why is it that people are afraid to speak about death anything because of the fact that it's the fear that their life is ending here. That's why the whole idea is, you know, that's ending here. We, because of the teachings of Ahlul Bayt in Islam, we uh, are encouraged to think about death. You know, we are told that you should think about death. You know, you should have death in your mind. And so we all the time as Shias, you know, always speak about death, talk about death, you know, do dhikr of death. And all the time we do this, you know, there are duas, there are ayat, there are hadith, every time we meet, you know, everything is like that, we're about that. But leaving us aside, if you meet someone else, and if you speak to death about them, they'll freak out. Right? Just imagine you're in your workplace, and you start to speak about death and say, so, have you ever wondered about death? <laughs> the person will look at you and says, you know, this guy is, you know, he's going crazy, he needs help. Right? He'll go to the boss and complain about you. That's what he'll do. The idea is they'll freak out about that. They can't handle it. They don't want to deal with it. It's hard for them. And it's naturally so. Really, if death was the ending of life, we would also be worried. Right? We would be freaking out at death also. The, 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 just to imagine that our life will end itself is a very depressing thought. It's going to end. That's it. And life that is led with the idea that death is the ending is a very depressing life to lead. Very depressing life to lead. How can you live a life? That's why you see here in America, when you look at it, they have so much and so many people on uh, antidepressant pills and care for depression. Why is that? The idea is that, you know, when you look at life itself, 
what's the meaning when there's no meaning in life and there's no completion of life if life is going to end truly this life becomes meaningless really it becomes meaningless for us to see that that way this is why when you look at Allah and how he speaks about our uh, life when we reach Jannah if someone a mu'min reach Jannah the first thing Allah will tell him the first welcome that he's going to get in Jannah and Allah says in the Quran he will say فَدْخُلُوهَا Khalidin, enter it forever this is eternal <coughs> here there is no news you are going to hear about your death you will not meet Malak al Maut here there is no ending here here you are forever you are eternal here that's it there's nothing for you here I mean everything here is forever you're going to live forever and we when we look at the idea of life the idea of life is that we are going to live forever <coughs> now if we know that do we believe it see again these are two different things I know life well okay it's going to be like this but do I really believe I'm going to live forever Let's look at it. You know, inshallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa If someone asks you, and be honest, right now you heard me say life is forever, you know, leave that aside. Truly, honestly answer yourself. If someone asks you, how long are you going to live for? What would be your answer? Alright? Honestly now, you know, now, now obviously I said we will live forever, that's besides the point, before that, right? Would we say that, well, I'll live for, well, you know, 60, 70, that's normal, you know, age expectancy in this country. So I'll live for that long. You see, just the answer is showing that we don't believe we'll live forever. Right? We don't believe it. We, we know it, Allah says it in the Quran, we read it so many times, we'll live forever, but... We just don't believe we are going to live forever. See, this is the problem with most people is that it's not that you know, they, they don't have knowledge, it's that they don't believe in the knowledge that they have. Right? That's the issue with believers. Right? They know many things. You have heard so many things in speeches and this and that and that. You know what? You know enough to go to Jannah. That's it. You know enough. But it's, knowledge is never the problem for the school of Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt have spread enough knowledge, enough awareness. The problem we have is not the knowledge, it's the belief in the knowledge. Do we really actually believe in this knowledge that we have? Do we have conviction that this is going to happen? This is where we lack. Yes, I know this, I know this, I know this. Okay, why isn't that knowledge not affecting your life then? Well, I know I'm going to die and I'm going to live forever. Well, why isn't the knowledge of death changing the way you live? How much is it affecting your life? How much is it reminding you of your real life? How much is it, my friends? Because this is where we want to really uh, ponder over and make our lives real. Because we don't want to end up like those people who, about whom uh, we see the hadith has come that moon that the people are sleeping they will wake up when they die right? we don't want to end up like that right? we want to be of those people who are awake while we are alive here right? and understand what life is this is why the first attribute of life is that life is forever life is for Allah that's what Allah says this is forever. I didn't create you to die. I created you to live forever. This is uh, one of the reasons why we see that uh, how much are we um, upset at losing this life or losing the opportunities that this life is affording us. How much are we upset at that? Most of us get upset when we lose money or when we lose things. We don't 
we get upset when we lose time. Right? If you lose time, okay, it's all right, you know. We do that. You know, you watch a movie for three hours, well, three hours, nothing, you know. It's like, whatever. Right? Watch a game for three hours, you know, it just goes away like that. Right? And we're not even upset at that. In fact, we're enjoying it. Right? We enjoy the fact that we waste time and opportunity, right? So now, we have a hadith from Imam Sajjad alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. In which he says that I wonder at those people who get upset, you know, at losing things, but they're not upset at losing their time. This time that you have, which is your life, you're losing it. He said, I'm, I'm really amazed at those people. Because they really haven't made a good judgment knowing what is important in their life. And Allah says, Wal asr in the insana lafi khusr. It's time that's more important for him. Time should be what's really regarded. And unfortunately, we live our lives such that when we have the time, we don't make use of it. And when we don't have time, then we think about it. Oh, we don't have time. Look at it. That's the way we are. You see, in our, like in our young age, most human beings, they waste so much time. Now when they get old and they're about to die and they know they have no time, now they're wondering, oh man, I wish you know, I had more time. But you had a lot of time. You had so much time. Why aren't you? Changing that. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa When we get older, right, truly, and this is, I want you to understand where the subject of aql comes in. Where does this aql come in? Here is what I want you to understand from aql in the view of our life. You might have heard such statements about, you know, like from old people, or from people who are older. They say, oh, when we lived our times, they were, you know, those were the good old days. Right? Now when you look at those good old days, it's okay, what happened right now? Why were those the good old days and not now? You see, understand this concept, because when we live with the wrong concepts, this is what happens. To us, Every day of our life should be better than the day before. Every year that we were going to live is going to be better than the year before. This is the concept. Allah gave aql so that we improve, so that we go for the best. So we, we try to make ourselves better. If our past is better than what we are today in the present, then it means we are in a state of decline and in a very unfortunate state. The idea about us when we want to live our life is that our akhirat, our future should be better than our past. The idea Islam gives about life is to say that, listen, your future should be better than your past. Whatever you have lived in your life, you should say, that's nothing. What's coming in my life is better than what happened in my life. This is life. This is the idea of life. When you understand that life is forever, then how can these years that you live, these 10, 20, 30, 40 years, be the best of your life? There should be nothing compared to what's coming. But the idea is that since you wasted your time, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, now people think, okay, you know what? The only place I'm going is hell, so I'll see you in hell, and hence my life will be miserable after that. But that's not the way for us to look at things. Allah is saying life is defined as forever. You know, this is what I'm trying to explain today, forever. What does this mean, forever? Forever, what it means is that when we look at our life like that, then this shouldn't matter at all. It should be completely irrelevant of what we are doing. This is nothing compared to what's coming. And hence, that's what we need to look at. We should be a people whose future is better and brighter than our past. Our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. This is a mu'min. This is what a mu'min's attitude is. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 
there is one that uh, hadith we have which it says you know cursed is that person whose past is better than his future whose yesterday is better than his tomorrow right why because he hasn't used his aql he hasn't used his intellect that's why so now when we understand that life is forever when you completely understand and have a conviction that I am going to live forever, then my friends, the next thing that we have when you are going to live forever is the fact that how are you going to bear the life of this world? I mean, if you know that, you know, your hereafter is forever, and Jannat is like that, and all of these great things are there, and you still have to live here, in this world, what would your attitude be? This is what we see in Hadith and Ayats. It is said that uh, the attitude of a mu'min is it says, Qulubuhum mahduna. Their hearts are sad. They are saddened when they're living their lives. You know, you're going to be happy here. Oh, I'm greatly happy here. No, you know, happy in the sense that, you know, this life is what makes me happy. But life is forever and I am stuck here. And this is what makes us sad. The moment you see him, his heart is sad. But the sadness has some unique qualities in it. The first thing that it has is that it's hidden. He never reveals it to others. You see, when you become sad because of dunya, then it shows in your face and your expression and how you behave with others. You're sad, always. Uptight. And okay, what's wrong with you? Why are you sad for? Good dunya. But when your sadness is due to your akhirat, then you don't show it to others. In fact, when you meet them, you will, you will never notice them, that they're sad. It's hidden inside of them. The second thing about this sadness is that it's subtle. It's very subtle. It affects you in the most beautiful ways. This sadness. This is what happens when you're sad because of akhirat. But when you're sad because of dunya, it affects you in the wrong way. High blood pressure, you know, uh, diabetes, you know, other kind of illnesses. Because you're sad and you're taking the pressure on yourself. This is what happens. If your sadness is for that, and this real, the reason the sadness is because of the fact that they know life is forever. If you didn't know life was forever, then you would be sad about dunya, not about akhirat. And the next thing that this sadness does is that it doesn't affect your behavior. When you are with the people, you will see that you will never notice it. No one noticed, no one noticed the Messenger of Allah ever change his behavior with other people. This and that, unless it has to do something with azab. When he heard some ayat about azab, he would shed, he would shed tears and fear, not of uh, azab, of what will happen to those people who will go there, just to imagine that. He would do that. But other than that, when he deals with people, akhirat would not make him sad. I mean, if the sadness would not show in the eyes and his face. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So my friends, naturally, we don't like death. No one should like death in the meaning of completion of life, in the meaning of termination of life. Naturally, we don't like it. We have been made to live forever. This is what we are. The first thing to understand about life is that you are alive forever. Ibrahim, when he saw the sun going down and the moon going down, he expressed himself and said, I don't like things that die away. Things that die away is not something naturally likable for a human being. Things that end, they don't, they're not liked by us. We don't like things that end. Ending is always sad for us. Ending is always a sad thing for us. Unless it's an ending of a bad movie, you know, then we're happy we got out of it. Right? But other than that, ending itself is a sad thing for us to 
uh, experience to know just the fact that someone is ending, you see, it, it's hard for us. If you hear that someone has ended, you know, they have died, you know, it's hard. It's, it's not easy for us to deal with it. Right? The fact is that we don't like anything that ends. Naturally so. Ambiya didn't like it. And they lived a life of Iman. And Iman doesn't like to end. This is one of the important things to understand. And we as Mu'min, when we look at our life, and when we look at the fact that we are going to live forever, then it means that we, at the time we live forever, then we are thinking about that life. And this is where our Akal now comes in and says, listen, choose the best for yourself. What is the best for yourself? This life or that life? This life or that life that is forever? Or this life that is only for a few minutes? That's where the choice is made of intelligence. People make the choice of intelligence. No, I want that. I want the one that I'm going to live forever. That's what I want. This is Hadith that when you look at it, it is Aqalun Nas Andarahum Bil Awaqibah. The most intelligent of people are those who have their sight on their consequence, on what is at the end. Those who look at the consequence or the akibat of everything, they are the most intelligent people. So, intelligence is not decided by who is most educated. Intelligence is decided by who has made the choice that's best for his akhirat. That's how intelligence is divided. So when I see someone, I don't say he's intelligent because he has done PhD. I say he's intelligent because he chose his akhirat over his dunya. That means he's intelligent. This is, this is how you know someone is intelligent. Man, this guy, you know, I, I mean, he might be a redneck, you know, uneducated guy, this and that, but because he chose akhirat over dunya, he's the most intelligent guy. He's the most intelligent. That's why you know who's intelligent. Otherwise, you know, intelligence is not someone who's educated. Education has nothing to do with intelligence. It's a wrong concept. If it has something to do with intelligence, you would have many great doctors and scientists who worship idols. Right? Yeah, many. I, you know, for example, great doctors and educated people and this and that, and, and they go home and they worship an idol. Then their uncle intelligence teach them that this is wrong? I, it means that they're not intelligent. They're not intelligent. Intelligence is about the choices we make, someone who looks at, his, uh, at the ending of his consequences the most. Just one story. An old man came to the prophet and asked him and said that, listen, I helped you once. Remind him, say, no, on that day, on that day, I helped you, and um, I want my reward now for that help that I gave you. The prophet said, yes, go ahead, what do you want to ask? Ask me. And he said, so are you going to give me anything I ask? Are you going to grant me any wish that I have? He said, yes, I will grant you any wish that you have. Go ahead, ask me. You know what that person asked him? He asked him, that, okay, Ya Rasulullah, my wish is that I want to be with you in the Akhirat. That's what I want. I want to be next to you in the Akhirat. I imagine this, you know, now to Rasulullah, you know, and this, is, this is not an easy wish to grant. You know, I mean, here Rasulullah, how can he make a judgment on him and say yes, and this guy will do anything, and hey, listen, How's that going to work? So, the first thing Rasulullah asked him before he replied is very strange. This is what I want you to understand. What Rasulullah asked this person is that, tell me this wish that you're asking. Did you make this up yourself or did you hear it from someone else? You see, understand that. He's not trying to put the person down that, you know, okay, you're dumb this and that. But he's trying to make him realize, he's trying to make him realize what he's asking for. He's trying to make him think that, do you really know what you're asking? Do you comprehend the enormity of this wish? Do you know what it means? Look at this, this is, you know, I mean, 
A lot of times we ask for things we don't know about. Sometimes, you know, yes, Ahlul Bayt want us to aim high. Allah wants us to aim high. But sometimes that aiming high, the idea behind it is to understand what you're asking for. Sometimes we ask for things we have no clue about. We have no clue about, we have no understanding about. For example, we ask, you know, for the reappearance of Imam Zamana. That Imam Mahdi, you know, he should come back to us, that he should be with us. Do you know what you're asking for? Are you sure you want that? Are you completely sure you can handle that? That's a whole different thing, my friends, and asking what Imam Zaman is, that he'll come down here and, yes, you know, it's a whole different thing. What is Imam Zaman when you ask about him? People don't understand what they're trying to ask for when they ask for Imam Zaman. They have no clue what they are saying. Because if they understood, okay, why do you want the Imam to come back? Right, why do you want the Imam to come back, you ask them. Well, inshallah, if the Imam comes back, you know, then he's going to establish justice. He's going to establish justice, all right? And he's going to get rid of all the zalimin and oppressors. So he's going to get rid of zalimin. So you want the Imam to come so he can get rid of these bad guys, right? So what? After that, what? Well, then, you know, we'll go on with our business. Then we can do business in the right way. <laughs> we can earn some money. These guys are stopping us from earning money. <laughs> so you want the Imam to come back so you can have a better business? Right? You want Imam to come back so you can have a peaceful life? You want the Imam to come back so you can have the blessings of earth and this and that, so all of these things happen? I mean, that is so selfish. It's like, for example, a son waiting for his dad only because he's going to get him gifts. Right? Only because he's going to get him gifts. You know, oh, my dad's coming, he's going to bring me gifts. Huh? What about the dad? He's coming. What about him? Do you care about him? Is he? This is a wrong idea of that. Waiting for Imam is more than that, my friends. Waiting for Imam is that uh, the justice and the, the hukumat of Allah and the government and all that, that's all outside. That will happen. Imam will come, he'll make it happen. Finish. Alhamdulillah, that's done. But Imam, the reason I'm waiting for you is because of you. You're the one that I love. You're the one that I'm waiting for. I want you. You're the one that I want. You know, not this hukumat will come, that's fine, that's fine. The blessings of earth will show themselves, that's fine. All of these are there, but you are the one that's more special than all of these things. You are the special one. This is that realization. If a moment doesn't have that, then he's very selfish. You're waiting for the imam because this will happen to him and he'll get this and he'll get that. This is a wrong way of looking at the imam, right? This is a wrong way, idea of looking at the imam. For us, the Imam should be more than just what he brings with him. He should be himself. We haven't recognized himself. Same thing we have at Jannah. Right? In heaven, you know, what are you waiting for heaven for? If I ask you what is heaven, you're going to go to heaven, right? Now, the answer is, okay, you know, do you want to go to heaven? Yes, uh, we want to go to heaven. Okay? <laughs> what do you want to go to heaven for? Uh, Allah mentions it in the Quran that you get Hurul Eeen. Right? When Eid are there, you know, you get mansions, better neighborhood, right? Better food. So, wait a minute. You want to go to heaven to upgrade your food, upgrade your house, upgrade your wife, you know? Is this what you want to go to heaven for? Is this the idea of heaven? Is this the idea of Jannah? My friends, it's one thing, you know, that these things are there. But the real reason, the real excitement, the real pleasure of Jannah is that we can have this special relationship with Allah. Allah, it's you. Because of you, I want to come to Jannah. Not because of these things. Because of you, are, yes, these things are important. These things are there. Allah says, you'll get them. Yes, we'll get them. But you know what? You are the best thing there. You are the best thing there. That's what I want. And my friends, this is the idea behind it. For us, when we ask for something, do we know what we are asking for? 
We ask for Jannah. Do you know why you want Jannah? You ask for Imam Zamana. Do you know why you want Imam Zamana? These are important things that we need to reflect about in these hadiths and these incentives that we have been given. These are things that we need to worry about and try to think and ponder over. Why do I want the Imam to come with me? What relationship do I have with the Imam? Inshallah, I'll try to explain that more inshallah tomorrow. But all I can say is this, my friends, right? There's a, you know, there's a um, hadith we have uh, regarding uh, Imam Zaman, right? In which um, uh, Amir al muminin you know, who is the chief of all the believers, and he was a personality, he was such a person that uh, that uh, a lady like Fatima was in love with him. Meaning he was that good. You know, for Fatima to fall in love with someone, you know, she is, you know, she is the, the you know, the height of Ismat and Taharat, purity. For her to fall in love with Imam Ali, Imam Ali has to be something. For her to sacrifice everything for Imam Ali, Imam Ali has to be something. And that Imam Ali, his wish in life, he used to wish all the time. His wish in life, he used to hit himself on the chest and say, Oh, oh, how I wish I could see my Mahdi when he comes. Imam Mahdi, compared to the rest of the Anbiya and Awliya, he is, as in the words of Hadith, is like a peacock that is in comparison to all the birds. He's that beautiful. He's that good. This is Imam Mahdi. And hence, you know, why should we wait for him? Why should we have love for him? Having the right idea about Imam Mahdi is very important, my friends. Inshallah, may Allah help us gain that marifat and make us uh, mu'min and inshallah, helper of Imam and Zaman. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Brothers, uh, we have five minutes for Azan. Uh, if you want to ask a question or something, you know, we can do one question, I guess. Can you get a question answered last night? Last night's question. I wanted to answer it again so we can go ahead. All right. This is the question about aql, right? The role of the aql in our actions, right? Uh, my friends, aql, what it does is that it gives value to our actions. It makes our actions what they are. In other words, I do good, I do bad. Okay, there is that involvement of the aql of, of me doing good. But how valuable is the good deed that I did? And how valuable is the bad deed that I did? You know, this intensity of our action is due to the aql. And that's where Allah says that I will, uh, I will uh, reward through you and I will punish through you. Because the action itself has only a certain amount of deed. Meaning that we do our action, it means nothing unless what the reason behind it was. So, for example, in this situation when we look at it, we see that, for example, uh, I will be praying, right? And Imam Ali is praying. And our prayer are the same. You know, I also make ruku, he also makes ruku. I make sajda, he makes sajda. Then, why is his prayer more than mine? I'm doing the same things that he's doing. But it's more than mine. It's more than mine because of the reasoning behind the prayers. See, everything is according to reasoning. How, on what reason did I deal with? Where did I use my aql to do this? That's what's important. So now what happens is because of this, because of reasoning, that Allah he gives punishment and reward due to reasoning, now you can understand something from here. Right? You can understand something from here. We have hadith. I don't want to mention the hadith because of lack of time. Just explaining this example. Uh, a mu'min will go to Jannah forever. Right? A, an infidel, someone who disobeyed Allah, 
rejected Allah will go to hell forever. Now tell me, is his actions uh, worthy or deserving of heaven forever and hell forever? I mean, he did wrong for how many years? 20, 30, 40, 50 years? And he's going to be put in hell forever? And this person, how long did he do good deeds for? 40, 50 years? And he's going to be put in heaven forever? This is what we need to understand. My friends, uh, your action, your action is never equal to the punishment or the reward that you get for it. First thing, first principle. Right? A person steals something, he does the crime for 10 minutes, he gets 10 years. Now do you call it ju just? 10 years for only 10 minute crime, you should be in jail for 10 minutes. A person rapes a woman in 15 minutes, he gets 15 years. So you can say, what? 15 years for 15 minutes, this is wrong. No, the idea is that uh, the punishment is never equal to the action. Why? Because of the reasoning behind it. Because of the akal behind it. The same thing here is with us. And the same thing is with us also. For example, a mu'min wants to pray Laylatul Qadr all night. His heart is saying, I want to worship Allah all night. He makes one hour of worship, two hours of worship, and then he gets tired. He gets tired. He can't go on. His physical limitations are stopping him from worshipping Allah forever. But his heart and his desire and his intention wants to go on worshipping Allah forever. So Allah is saying that, okay, you want to worship me forever, but because of your physical limitations, you can't do that. So now I will put you in heaven forever because you want to worship me forever. See, this is where akal comes in. Reasoning comes in. It's the reasoning that we have. That is why we are getting forever. Now, a non-Muslim, let's say someone who rejects Allah, he goes to the bar, he gets one peg, two shards, three shards, after a while, you see, he can't go on. After five, six shots, that's it. His body can't handle it. He'll start throwing up. Uh, he won't be able to do it. But if you ask him, hey, do you want to drink more? He says, yeah, but I can't. So he wants to drink more. He wants to drink forever. He wants to disobey Allah forever. But his physical limitations are stopping him from doing that. So Allah is saying, because you want to worship me forever, and you have proven that through your intellect, so now I will send you to hell forever also. Right? The idea of foreverness is from the akal, not from our actions. From the akal, Allah is proving it. So akal is that which gives value to our actions. It gives the intensity of punishment and reward. This is what the akal does. Otherwise, actions, they are not resulting in wrong. For example, if I drink a glass of water and I drink it, if I drink the glass of water, right, this is water to me, I drink it, and later on, find out that this was beer. Now, is this a crime that I did? Even though I did some, I drank something haram, but it's not a crime. Why? Because my niyat wasn't there. My akal, my reasoning wasn't there. You see, that's the difference. This is the difference. Right? Our actions have nothing to do with, with the reward or punishment. It's the akal that is the basis of our punishment and reward, inshallah. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll get ready. I think Azan time is up. Salawats. Allah.